Hello, and welcome to the Walrus Leadership Forum, Trust and Democracy. I am Jennifer Hollett. I am the Executive Director of the Walrus. I'm also your host and moderator, and we are thrilled to be joining you online, bringing together people from across the country in conversation. I'd like to start by acknowledging the land that I'm on here in Toronto, Ontario, to Toronto. A land acknowledgement helps us recognize history, thinking about how it informs where we are now and the changes that can be made going forward in a commitment to reconciliation. Our offices at the Walrus and where I am now are located within the bounds of Treaty 13, signed with the Mississaugas of the Credit. This land is also the traditional territory of the Anishinaabe, the Haudenosaunee, and the Wendat peoples. And today, Toronto is home to many diverse First Nations, Inuit, and Métis peoples. We are honored to contribute to a tradition of storytelling, storytelling. And we encourage you to take a moment right now to reflect on the land that you're on, wherever you're joining us from today. As part of the ongoing work of Reconcilia Action, we encourage you to read the 94 calls to action recommended by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And we will drop that into the chat now. This year, the walrus turns 20. And we are celebrating 20 years of Canada's conversation, taking a look at who we are now. You can find our stories wherever you're looking for stories, online at thewalrus.ca, but also in print on newsstands or by subscribing to The Walrus. You can also listen to our podcasts or join our events like this one here. And this work is powered by our donors, supporters, and partners. So thank you all for being here and being a part of this and to Proof Strategies for partnering with us on this special event. All right, this is for the audience. Let us know where you're joining us from today. We have a question, just take a moment, fill it out. Okay, we have audience members really registered from all over the country. This is one of my favorite things about these online events. So hello to Kelowna, Whitehorse, Grand Perry, Brampton, Ottawa. This is great. Thank you for sharing your city with us. We also encourage you to share this event with your community, uh, whether it's a thought or reflection or a screen grab of how you're watching us. If you share it on social media, make sure to tag us at The Walrus. Now, this is the third year we've done this event, examining trust in Canadian society. And today we will be exploring the challenges facing our leaders and institutions, who Canadians trust now and how trust can ultimately be strengthened. We'll be looking at the impact trust levels have on our democracy. And we've seen from the US to Brazil, the storming of government buildings, and just over a year ago, the occupation of Ottawa by protesters. And if you take a look at the day's headlines, right now, many of them test our current trust levels. So we're going to kick things off first with a presentation of the key findings from the 2023 Can Trust Index, and then we'll move to a moderated panel discussion with our experts and your audience at home. So we invite you at any point to submit your questions via chat, and my job as moderator is to get to as many as possible. As well, we'll follow up from this event and be sure to share the full 2023 Proof Strategies can trust index reports. You can take some time to go through that. Coming up, we will be hearing from Bruce McLellan, President and CEO of Proof Strategies, Genevieve Tomney, Vice President, Public Affairs, Proof Strategies, the Honorable Catherine McKenna, Principal, Climate and Nature Solutions, and Chair, UN Secretary General Expert Group on Net Zero, the Honorable James Moore, Senior Business Advisor, Dentons, and Zane Velji, Partner and Vice President, Strategy at Northweather. To start today's conversation, please welcome to the Zoom stage right now, Bruce McClellan. Hi, Bruce. Hi, Jen. Nice to see you. Thanks everyone for joining us today. And Jen, thank you for hosting. I'm sure this is gonna be a lively discussion. Whenever we schedule an event about trust months in advance, it always seems that by the time we get there, the issue has become more urgent. The recent events in Ottawa around elections and interference uh, are, make this event the same. It's more urgent now than it was when we scheduled it. I wonder if we even have a special rapporteur in the audience today. 
Our firm has been tracking trust now in Canada for almost a decade. This year, our special report on trust in government and democracy can be downloaded at cantrustindex.ca. In a very short summary of the report, we have concerns. Trust is indispensable. It's like a lubricant that helps economies work faster and more efficiently and more productively. Trust makes human relationships more collaborative and, and positive. Trust is fundamental to healthy democracies. We need conversations like today to build trust, to understand how it works and how we can improve it in our democracy and in our government. These are two sides of the same coin. The trust we have in an election then extends into the legitimacy of governments to act and lead our country. There are numerous forces nowadays working against trust from within and outside our country. We need to be transparent about them. We need to talk about how they're having an impact if they are and what can be done about them to counter them and to maintain trust in our system. Political debate and differences of opinion are part of a healthy democracy. However, that should not mean that our democratic system becomes a wedge issue. We need political leaders now to build unity around trust in our democracy, not pit people against each other. Our electoral process is too important. In terms of government, 64% of Canadians in our research agree that government has an important role to play in making the lives of Canadians better. However, trust will come when governments can actually deliver. We need infrastructure and services, whether it be pipelines, transit lines, clean drinking water, surgeries in a reasonable time frame, or our passports renewed. This is a challenge for, for politicians and public servants. Our Can Trust Index also this year reveals a concern around generational trust. Trust in the electoral system in Canada right now is lowest among youngest Canadians. This is also a concern. To walk us through a few of the highlights of our 2023 Can Trust Index research, I'm going to turn it over now to my colleague, Vice President of Proof Strategies, Genevieve Tommy. Over to you, Jen. Thank you, Bruce. And I am so happy to have the opportunity to share some of the highlights of the 2023 Can Trust Index. As you've heard from Bruce, this work is incredibly important to us here at Proof. And we do it because we know there is value in understanding the uniquely Canadian trust landscapes. I'm going to start today with a brief overview of the deep well of insight that is the 2023 Can Trust Index. And I would encourage everyone, if you haven't already, to take some time to go to our website and really dig in deeper after we wrap up here today, because this will be fairly high level. And trust me, you will find something new and interesting and, and relevant to what you do, and it'll be well worth your time. So today I'm going to highlight some of what we at Proof Strategies found most enlightening this year. I'm going to give you a macro and a more close-up view of some of the results, and then we'll talk about some trust drivers. So what we can work on in government, business, and society to really improve trust in Canada. Okay. First, before we dive in, uh, just a quick note on the methodology of CanTrust. We use a seven point scale to measure trust levels, which you'll see illustrated later on. Um, and this year we surveyed more than 1500 Canadians using a national opt-in panel. The sample was representative of Canadian population statistics by region, age, and gender, and done in both official languages. And if we can move to the next slide, these results are fresh. Uh, we were in market with this survey in mid-January of this year. So we're bringing some really um, relevant and recent insights to the table today. Okay, next slide. Uh, so what are we seeing this year? Overall, a bit of a trust recovery, as Bruce mentioned, from the really historic low trust levels that we saw during the pandemic, and also some new insights. As you heard from Bruce, for the first time, we've done a special report this year on trust in government and democracy in Canada. And as you can probably imagine, the results speak to some real concerns that Canadians have in how their governments are serving them. We know that political leaders still have a long way to go when it comes to building trust with Canadians, and we're going to unpack that a bit further. Okay, so what you're seeing here right now is when we zoom out 
to look at aggregate trust scores over the life of the CAN Trust Index. So you see illustrated here that the level of trust has rebounded back to what we saw pre-pandemic. And this is good news. But then if you look wider over time in the eight years that we've been measuring, we're still seeing an overall decline in Canadians' trust. And to us, this decline really shows that Canadians have become more suspicious generally and that they're less confident in the information that they're getting from groups that underpin Canadian society. So let's take a look at the next slide and what's helping bring the overall numbers back up this year. And you'll see a pretty significant rebound in some key organizations highlighted here. So first of all, I wanna draw your attention to a 15 point jump back up in the percentage of Canadians who trust government to do what is right for Canada. It's heartening, it's an encouraging swing back in the right direction, but still a relatively low number overall. Um, and when it comes to news media, again, we're seeing an eight point rebound from you know, real lows during the pandemic in terms of the kind of trust that Canadians place in that institution. On the next slide, um, as Jen called out earlier, I know we have folks joining us today from across Canada. So you'll probably find this one interesting if you're in one of the regions. Um, and the regional picture also shows a trust rebound, which particularly dramatic in British Columbia, which is interesting, and Quebec continuing to trend higher when it comes to overall trust. And I know that our panelists are also representing some different regional interests today. So I'm very curious to get their insights on what might be behind this breakdown as well. Okay, next we're going to look at key government adjacent institutions. And we're seeing a lift in a couple of key organizations where there's really been a lot of effort put recently into rebuilding trust. So looking at the Canadian military, for example, and the RCMP. On the flip side of that, as our economy has taken a turn for the worse and Canadians are becoming more aware of the role of Canada's central bank through various sources of information, we're seeing that institution flip from having majority trust to below 50%. And again, you know, it's, it, you can't attribute cause and effect here, but you can start to think about what are the perceptions and the work that's being done either to build or to undermine trust in these systems. So on the next slide, let's just uh, talk for a moment about this report that we did this year. We know from our eight years of research that if Canada has a trust problem, the source of it has a lot to do with how we as Canadians feel about our governments. So despite that rebound that we, that we were showing, it's still around one in three Canadians who trust their government to do the right thing, which is not a great number. Um, so we wanted to probe that a bit further this year. And the results you'll see on the next slides come directly from that special report on trust in Canadian government and democracy. So governments, we know have been under intense scrutiny during the pandemic. We know that there has been a rise in populist politics in Canada that actually serves to promote mistrust um, in some cases. But governments of all levels also bear a lot of responsibility for this deficit in trust that we're seeing because as Bruce was speaking to, Canadians fundamentally don't believe that what's being promised is actually going to happen. So every delayed or botched effort at actually delivering on promises, programs and policies, whether it's school repairs or more affordable housing units, that's going to risk a further erosion of public trust and undermine future efforts at public engagement and, and connecting with Canadians. This next slide breaks that open a little bit because what it illustrates is that Canadians actually believe their governments play an important role in providing the services they need, but they don't think they're doing all that great a job of delivering on that important role. So you'll see um, there's some divide between how much trust Canadians have in public servants versus politicians, and perhaps not surprisingly, uh, almost half of Canadians believe they could actually get in there and do a better job. <clears throat> So on the next slide, the results um, we're looking at here are particularly interesting because they illustrate two important findings from our special report. One, that Canadians are pretty divided on whether they trust that our election system is fair and representative. And given some of the conversations we're having now at a federal level around the security of our democracy, this becomes even more meaningful. Um, the second key finding on the right here um, is the breakdown between millennials and boomers and the portrait it paints of that younger generation's increasing skepticism about the election system. And we all know we can continue <clears throat> to see historically low voter turnout in this country. And this kind of disenfranchisement with the whole system is, is likely possibly a root cause of that. 
So on the next slide, I'm a lot of the folks here today on our panel are, are people who've worked in politics. And, and this is a compelling and, and a fairly concerning slide if you have that experience or even if you're an observer. What you see here is a breakdown of how Canadians view political parties in our country. And on the right, you see that broken down further by political affiliation. And the result is really decisive here that no matter what your politics is, most Canadians see political parties as a force that divides us. And I'll be very interested to hear our panelists thoughts on why that might be, but certainly there's going to be an impact on what that does to Canadians levels of trust in politicians, which again, we see year after year are very low. And I think this next result um, is an interesting one to show next because we know that in Canada, the party system is really most directly tied to federal and provincial governments. And here we see that more than half of Canadians say they are either frustrated or angry with those two levels of government. And then that flips when we look at municipal governments where the majority of Canadians say they feel content. Okay, so coming to the wrap up here, as a former journalist, I'm, I'm always jumping to probably the same question that you may be arriving at. What do we do about this? And, and while building trust is not easy, it is also doable. And as we've demonstrated, you can measure it too. Um, because Canadians are telling us there are very clear things they want to see from leaders when it comes to driving trust. So on the next slide, the good news is that the elements that drive trust in Canada have remained pretty stable. Things like having values that are close to my own, having a leader that communicates openly, these are very clear metrics. And when decisions and policies are linked to values, people are more likely to understand them and to trust. So if we want to build trust, it's abundantly clear that values and most importantly, actions matter a lot. Trust can be built through consistent demonstrated values and competency. And in government, delivering on what you say you will do goes a long way to building that trust. There's a lot more to say on this and we really do have the perfect people to discuss this topic today. I know we're all looking forward to the conversation that is to come, so thank you. Thank you so much, Genevieve and Bruce. These findings give us a lot to think about and a lot to discuss. Now I'll invite our panelists to join me on screen. Uh, so I ask all of you to turn in your cameras now. And as you do so, I'll uh, reintroduce you to our audience. Joining us from Ottawa, we have Catherine McKenna, a principal at Climate and Nature Solutions. Catherine previously served as Canada's, Canada's Minister of the Environment and Climate Change and as Minister of Infrastructure and Communities. Over in Vancouver, we have James Moore, a senior business advisor at the multinational law firm Dentons. In his political life, he served as Canada's Minister of Industry and as Minister of Canadian Heritage and Official Languages. In Calgary, we have Zane Velji, who is a partner and vice president of strategy at North Weather. Zane also serves on the board of the Samara Center for Democracy, is the host of the award-winning podcast, The Strategist, and in 2017 was campaign manager for Calgary Mayor Nahed Nenshi. And in Toronto, Bruce McClellan is president and CEO of Proof Strategies. He was previously active in politics and served as Chief of Staff to the Minister of National Defense, the Honorable Perrin Beattie. A reminder to our audience, if you have a question for any of our panelists or a question about the trust findings we just saw, you can enter that in the chat and I'll do my best to get to as many audience questions as possible. Now, before we turn to our audience questions, I'd love to go around and hear just some opening thoughts and reflections from our guests. James, if you could kick us off, that would be great. Sure, and thanks very much for the forum and obviously an enormously important topic. You know, when I briefly taught political science, I used to remind students that government is the and it is a is a cycle of trying to answer the question of how should we live together that's what government is we are forced to live together so what are the rules what are the constitutional structures what are the laws and all that so trust is a fundamental ingredient in all of that so this is a really important conversation and i think when you examine trust in government i think that i look at it sort of as sort of three windows through which trust needs to be established in a healthy democracy trust in the process by which we choose our political 
leaders, um, which obviously is being tested now in, in, in the current media environment, and we can go into that. The second lens is trust in the actual actors as politicians and whether or not they have the right intent, right intention, the right capacity, uh, and the right structures around them to govern effectively, uh, either through a you know, parliamentary model or electoral process, and the way in which they carry themselves and the checks and balances. And the third is trust in institutional government, the government that will be there regardless of which political party happens to be in power, whether it's a majority or a minority dynamic, federal, provincial, municipal, and government institutions like the police uh, and others. So trust in those sort of three windows, uh, I think, needs to be understood. Just a couple of comments on the on the results that came in and, you know, my experience having been a politician, a candidate five times over, over 15 years, you know, it, I think it's not surprising that the public increasingly sees politicians and politics as a source of division, in part because the way in which politics is practiced now is very different, I think, than it's been in the past. You know, the traditional instinct about democracy, as you say, voters get to choose their politicians. But I think because of the way in which we now understand data and voter behavior, it's actually, the truth is politicians get to choose their voters. And you get to animate your base, weaponize your base. And it's a lot easier to get somebody so angry about the other that they will convince their neighbor or their daughter or their son to who's going to vote for the first time and get them to get them off the couch and to vote because they're so angry than it is to get a fresh new voter who's not really thought about things differently and convert them from another political party to yours. So the way in which politics can weaponize and divide is it's a much easier path to get your next set of voters by uh, energizing your base and 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 doing so through uh, aggressive tactics. So I think it's not a surprise in that sense. The outcome of that is obviously a more divided populace, a more toxic environment, and a more divided society uh, that governments then have to triage when they get into office. So you know, just some of my comments, and I'll surrender to the other panelists for their observations. Thank you, James. Yeah, it's a reminder politics and campaigning has really moved beyond bumper stickers and, and lawn signs, and no doubt they play a role, uh, but it has changed a lot. Catherine, over to you. Uh, well, thanks. I'll, I'll say sort of ditto to a lot of what James said, but um, look, trust is kind of the minimum. I, I mean, I don't think it gets you everywhere because we need to have people be ambitious and be on board for really hard things, whether it's tackling climate change or getting through a pandemic. Um, but if you don't have the minimum, then people aren't going to vote. Um, you won't be able to get them on board and you're going to see the polarization. Um, so I'm pretty practical. Uh, and so, first of all, why do I think this happens? One, I'm going to say something that might be very unpopular with maybe politicians, but I'm a recovering politician, so it's OK. I mean, the reality is, too, often politicians uh, hide. They misrepresent. They misstate uh, facts. And at the worst, they lie. Um, and, and I'm not going to say all politicians do that. Um, but that does happen. And so that does erode trust. And often when there's an issue, I had to laugh in politics because I had never heard of this before. Issues management. Everything turns to issues management. And I said, well, wait a minute. Maybe there's an issue. Like, it's not just all a comms exercise. Like, maybe people are, are you know, have real concerns. And uh, and that relates to what Jean Chrétien gave the best piece of advice I ever got in politics. Jean Chrétien sat me down, and he wasn't particularly happy with what we were doing as a government, I'm sure. He said, les Canadiens sont raisonnables. Soyez raisonnable. I mean, be reasonable. And I think we, we have to respect Canadians. They're not stupid. Um, and they pick up when you're not responding to their concerns to, of course, the delivery. I mean, if you can't deliver on basic services and demonstrate on how you're delivering, and we've seen this, I think there was a conversation about people not being confident in delivering on climate change. Um, we have to deliver, like you can't just have targets and you need to deliver. And to do that, you have to be you know, pretty transparent and, and radically honest. And the problem is sometimes that's hard for politicians um, because you got to face some hard truths and say some things um, and, and demonstrate it's hard, like hard things in life are hard. And then there's social media. Now we can spend a lot of time talking about this, but the reality is um, they amplify the problems that I talked about, right? Like if you actually are misrepresenting, misstating, or you know, lying because there's political advantage to that, then you get to put it out on social media. It's great because then you go to what James was talking about, your, your base. You're going to go to your base and they're going to be just so angry. They're going to share it with their friends. We don't rely, sadly, on, on the objective sources as much anymore. We rely on our friends. Um, that's when we, we believe more what is shared by our friends. Um, and so 
you have that. And, and so I think these are all, you know, they're, they're all creating an atmosphere where people are just tuning out. Like, not only is it people are angry, it's also people don't want to engage. They don't want to uh, actually do things. And, and I mean, I know we'll talk a bit about solutions. I mean, very quickly, one, actually just reckon with the facts and be honest with people. Um, and if you screw up, tell people like, you know, what that happens to deliver deliver on issues and be honest when it's hard to deliver on issues, but be radically transparent, have dashboards everywhere about what you're doing. I think we did that on drinking water, um, but you, you have to show folks that there's some progress being made. And then I think you need to treat Canadians as a resource. So this is going beyond trust. Um, there's things like citizens assemblies. I don't have time to go into detail. Maybe I can if there's time, but stop seeing citizens as like, we just have to deal with them because they're kind of annoyed or angry or we got to convince them. Like, actually listen to them, because I find Canadians are actually pretty reasonable. And if you can bring a group, a different group of Canadians together and actually state a problem, Canadians actually want to find solutions. They want to be positive. They want to move forward. Thank you so much. Zane, want to bring you in now. Oh, what, what fantastic comments and what a privilege to be here. So thank you for having me. I won't relitigate some of the excellent points that my fellow panelists have made. I might highlight a few of them. You know, when I look at this research, for me, the overarching question is really about trust in each other, trust in our fellow citizenry. And one of the things that sticks with me from the report on Russian interference in the U.S. elections was that the Russians weren't incented to create net new divisions. They were incented to find the existing fractures in American society and pound on them, knowing that they're already divisions. And so to me, when I look at this data, how much of this is about governments large part of it. How much of it is about us, though, and our mistrust we have of each other and perhaps this polarized climate that we find ourselves in? You know, Catherine mentioned so social media. I'll, I'll just hit on that very quickly. I mean, the inflammatory algorithmic incentives of social media combined with the erosion that we're seeing, unfortunately, of, of some of our media, both in terms of uh, number of journalists as well as access and reach of those journalists, alongside what we've mentioned with political parties, their incentives to fundraise, their incentives to continuously win the message of the day argument at every cost, the message of the week argument at any and every cost, the message of the month argument at any and every cost. They're incented and set up and direction, directionally put in that course and chart in that course. All of this kind of leads to uh, the perfect storm that we find ourselves in. Um, but I'll kind of leave my comments with two areas of hope, because I do have a significant amount of hope that will hopefully echo uh, alongside uh, my comments later on today. Number one, I think defining us as a continuously and consistently polarized country that is leading to certain outcomes that we see, for example, in today's presentation, I think is a huge mistake. I think the majority of us are in the middle. The majority of us are trying to find our way. And it's the loud voices, the strong opinions strongly held at the polls that perhaps are overriding many of us that are the that are the folks in the middle that are open to perspectives, that are open to perhaps conversion, that are open to persuasion, conversation, platforms like this that have people with multiple party color jerseys coming together and saying we agree on more than we disagree on. So I think the majority of Canadians are there. The second piece of hope, I'll double click on it. It's the younger generation. I know in the in the in the data that there's young people that are skeptical of the electoral system and what it means to them and its validity. But man, oh man, am I ever pumped and jazzed by young people and their movement building, their meaning making, their ability to provide platforms for diverse coalitions of young people to come together to create solutions, to come as you are, to have an unbelievably empathetic version of the future set in, in course, I think that is going to be part and parcel of our recipe as we try to heal these divides, as we try to give voice to that 60% in the middle and, and, and not be defined by the extreme polls and, and the loud sort of corrosive nature of social media. I think it's it's that group that I turn to for, for hope in many ways. So happy to expand on any of that. And uh, thank you for having me. Great, thank you. Bruce, I have a question for you around trust, which is, like, what does it mean, you know, when you're surveying Canadians and asking them about trust, what impacts what we define as trust? Rational thinking, emotional thinking, um, would love just to know a little bit more about this word. 
Sure. Well, great question. In, in organizations, Jen, trust turns into loyalty, uh, turns into greater collaboration and sharing between employees. Um, a famous recent example is employees at Boeing who lost trust, decided not to speak up when they saw design flaws in aircraft. Um, if they don't have any trust, they won't feel they have any stake and they won't have the confidence to speak up. So trust makes a, an organization perform better, be more innovative and has higher loyalty among its team members. Um, those are incredible benefits, which, I mean, what business leader would not want to have those in their organ own organization or government leader for that matter as well. So um, my colleague, Jen talked about shared values. Um, values are hugely important. And of course, values differ from, from country to country. And that's why we have our unique Canadian trust study. Um, we're seeing now values different between generations and the younger Canadians. And, and I liked the comments we just heard, the optimism is encouraging. Um, younger Canadians are bringing different values to the table. Um, they're rightfully concerned about living costs, about the health of the planet. And they are looking for companies to take more leadership around these issues that's different than what boomers expected. So um, what does it look like? It looks like a better team doing better work if you build trust in your context. On the generational piece, Catherine, Gen Z, these are our future leaders. I'd say there are leaders now followed by millennials. So it is concerning that they have lower trust in government. And we know that the climate crisis will impact younger Canadians the most. What do you think the government can do to better serve the younger generations. Oh, well, I'll meet you there. Yep, great. Oh, one sec. We'll, uh, yeah, we got you on. It's great. I'm talking to myself. Um, <laughs> what do they need to do? We need to do yeah, like what could the government do to deliver on climate? Or... <laughs> like, you know what? Young people deserve, like, on climate. I've been outspoken recently just on like the facts. Like, I think what happens, and this is related to trust. And I was in government, so I hold myself responsible as well. Like sometimes, you know, there's so much going on and some of it's not good news. Um, like, look, young people, like they're just struggling. They've got a climate crisis that's super real. And the reality is there uh, is a lot of obfuscation on hard facts because it's not convenient in particular, honestly, to the status quo. Um, you can go to my Twitter and you can read about facts. That's what I've tried to do now. Now, I try to not just be Debbie Downer um, because we all have to be motivated. But I think what will really help uh, for young people is like, is actually if we say we're, we're going to do what we say we're going to do and we're going to be clear that it's hard and it will require a lot of work. But I'm working in the space um, on net zero and greenwashing. And I'm gonna be perfectly honest that there's a lot of greenwashing by Canadian businesses and uh, you know financial institutions and, and oil and gas. And, and that's important because if you put up your hand, you say you're a climate leader, there are things you need to do. And I actually think if we can just be objective about the challenge and where we need to get to, and of course we need good jobs. I mean, that's like a minimum, but this is the economic opportunity, but see it in that space but hold ourselves accountable. We will build trust, but we'll actually also deliver. Because as I said, trust is the minimum, right? Like at first I was like, just make mandatory voting. Everyone just has to vote. And then I was like, well, wait a minute. If I'm not voting, it's on the politicians. Like no one wants to come out and support us. So actually get people motivated and then part of the, the project. And the good news is about young people is I think they're a little bit done, right? They're just calling it out. They're marching on the streets. And people used to say to me, is it really hard that people are mad that you bought a pipeline or that young people are marching on the streets demonstrate? I said, no, that's actually good because we have to have hard conversations in life. And, and I think that's also important on the trust piece. Um, back to what Kretschia said. He said, like, they're not always going to be happy with the decisions you make. But if they think that you're being truthful to them, that you're being upfront, that you're working hard, that you screw up and you admit it, and then you you work even harder to do better, they'll actually trust you. And, and I think that's what's missing. Like, we just have to be a little more honest um, about what the challenge is and what the opportunity is. And then we got to have stretch goals. I'm a competitive swimmer. Like, I wanted to make the Olympics. I didn't make the Olympics. I made Olympic trials. But I had a long-term goal. And then every day, I just worked hard to do it. And I think that's what Canadians want their governments to do. 
They want them to not just announce things over and over. No one even knows what the announcements are. They want to see progress on, on a few real things, on climate change, on housing affordability, um, on equity, um, on you know the transition in jobs. And so I just think now my new approach to life is just being radically honest. And everyone just has to be accountable because when I talk to young people, that's what they want. And they're actually, to Zane's point, they're super motivated. And they don't want the status quo because the status quo is certainly not working for them. And it's not going to work for a sustainable future. And in, in fact, for Canada's competitiveness, to be honest, if we don't actually look at what's going on south of the border and what's going on globally in the transition. So I think we need to, you know, to motivate young people, we actually just have to deliver on what we say we're doing and we have to work with them. And recognize they don't want the status quo. They want us to do way better than what we're doing and stop patting ourselves on the back and say, well, it's actually pretty okay. It's also interesting because when politicians tell it like it is or speak like regular people, the public does seem to like that, even if they disagree with a, the with a politician. James, many Canadians see political parties as a dividing force in the country. Why do you think this is an issue and how could political parties work together and become a unifying force instead? Political parties are built to coalesce ideas and present alternatives to the government to solve contemporary problems, right? So, so division is not necessarily a bad thing. The question is whether, whether it's, you know, toxic and divisive for its own purposes. I mean, uh, you know, typically throughout, you know, the sweep of Canadian history, it was there was consensus around what the dominant issues of concern were, you know, maybe they weren't ranked in the same top five order, but we were all in the relative same ballpark of what the dominant issues were, you'd have regional differences in the country, because the dynamics of, of the, you know, the size of our country and regional, provincial nature of it economically, and so on. But, but generally speaking, in terms of a national interest, you would have a consensus on what the issues were, and then people would come to the table with altering points of view. Now, of course, it's not quite like that. Now, too much of our politics is elect me and I will screw over that guy. Allow me to be your warrior to go after those people. And, you know, there's always kind of been an element of that, but now it's more explicit than ever before. And it can be successful in a, in a, in a dynamic of lower voter turnout and lower voter participation. It's unsustainable in the long term because you 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 trigger a counter reaction over time and then a market opens up for a reasonable person to be the, the counter narrative to all of that. But the, the, the toxicity over the long term that that creates on our system is very worrying. You know how you break a... You know how you break a, um, a paper clip in half is you bend it and then you bend it and then you bend it and you bend it and you bend it. You do it enough times and eventually it snaps and it cracks and you can never get it back to what it was because you've you've, you've tested this, the capacity of that so many times that eventually people just it just breaks and cracks. I think the same thing is true with democracy, that if people aren't called out for excessive use of rhetoric and divisive tactics, I think that the long term stress is people just walk away. We know from Elections Canada studies that if a young person does not vote in the first three elections in which they are eligible to vote, either federal, provincial, municipal, if they just don't engage in those first three elections, the odds are over 80% that they won't vote their entire lives. So young people, they can, frankly, they can see bullshit a mile away and, they, and they're not interested. Um, you know, I, I think COVID uh, and the dynamics of politics and government and COVID, you saw Conservative government in Ontario get reelected. Conservative government in Saskatchewan get reelected. A liberal government in Ottawa get reelected. An NDP government in British Columbia get reelected. And the commonality of those four parties and provinces is that you had leaders who were, uh, at the, you know, who were seen to be putting the issue forward, surrendering to reason, making sacrifice, listening to the public, responding to the dynamic of a crisis. And the public, because we were all living in lockdowns and, and you know, the whole dynamic of COVID, we were all forced to have to deal with this and assess politics and governing on its surface that any political party that didn't rationally communicate and see to be seem to be surrendering to medical science and reason and thoughtful uh, solutions to this global pandemic, they were punished. And those who did do that were rewarded. And Jason Kenney in Alberta, who was seen to be trying to balance these things and, and faced a flare up on his on his right flank, was internally sacrificed as a consequence. So it, there's, there's a I think, a message in the COVID crisis and how that was handled and the public's reaction to it by rewarding politicians of differing stripes beyond sort of traditional voting alliances that 
we want people to govern responsibly, peace, order, and good government, and communicate clearly and be relentless in your transparency. Well, let's it get Alberta like in, uh, Zane, because aggregate trust is the lowest in the prairies. Uh, these provinces also have the lowest trust in their premiers and, and the prime minister. Thoughts on, on why this is? Yeah, I, I do. And do you mind if I just quickly address James's point here? Because I think it's just it's such a great point around young people smelling bullshit a mile away. Like, I think that is so true. And I think there's a couple of reasons for it that actually leads to the movements that they're building. Number one, to Catherine's point, for them, it's existential. Like this crisis is now. I do not have time for your bullshit because I have a, a, a world that is burning up right now, right, in many ways. And I think it leads to them creating movements that are significantly more authentic. This is, I think, one of the key... Uh, elements of movements that I've seen with young people, you know, as someone who's on the political left, um, I always feel like our movements are, are more righteous, but they're not always the most welcoming. They have these layers of purity tests often that, but how long have you been here? How long do you have these credentials? What many of the movements young people are building, they don't have time for that. They don't have the purity test. Come as you are, be as you are. We need you in the tent. And I think if there's a lesson to be taken for the overall health of democracy, or even just uh, for overall movement building is you got to create an attractive platform, a welcoming, empathetic, come as you are, we need all of you platform. And instead, what we've seen is our political parties uh, and sometimes our political leaders looking at individuals and saying, to James's point, how do I look at them as being someone on the outside looking in? How do I look at them as in a pugilistic way rather than someone that I can persuade and have in my corner? As it relates to Alberta, I mean, my, my or, or, or the Western provinces, I sit here in Alberta. Uh, my summation is simple. Um, we are complicated. We are not the monolith you think we are. We are textured. And I think a political mistake we often make is thinking that we ourselves are these textured three-dimensional people and our opposition, the folks on the other side, they're just a single thing. Well, we're not. You've got in Alberta, obviously, some of that Western alienation we want in that drives some of the, 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 the mistrust or distrust. But you also got a growing progressive class in our urban centers, 40% visible minority, 33% university educated, you know, a greater population under 18 than over 65. I'm not talking about Toronto, I'm talking about Calgary, right? So we are we are textured in many different ways. Uh, and then you layer on top of that, that there are needs that many in Western provinces actually believe their federal government can deliver better on climate being one of them than the provincial government. And so you have this perfect sort of squeeze happening right now, a group that feels like, to James's point, Jason Kenney wasn't right wing enough, dispense of him, we need further right, a group that's saying, whoa, my governments are going way far to the right, I want to be the counterbalance to that, we have, uh, you know, our own sort of needs as an urban center, and urban populations, young, educated, diverse, and then you add on, you know, this, this overall sort of complexity of the demographic figures of the Western provinces, it shouldn't surprise you that there's a perfect squeeze happening right now uh, in, in, in our Western provinces with that populist streak that's, that's always been present here. We have great audience questions coming in. This is from Steve. In an electoral system that grants 100% of legislative authority to a party that gets as little as 35% of the vote, can we be confident we live in a true democracy? Bruce, I, I see you nod in there. Well, I'm I'm glad to have a chance. I, as, as we've all been talking, you know, here we have a, a pretty politically diverse panel. Um, and we all seem to agree that political parties are misbehaving. Um, that politicians are, are behaving badly even um, in terms of, you know, I love the term James used about politicians now choose their voters um, instead of the opposite um, and, and firing up people and creating anger. Um, I'd be interested in everyone's comments on having preferential ballots where we would build an incentive into the system for politicians to appeal to more than just the 33% of the electorate they think they need to form a majority. Um, I, I think that would be the motivation we need for politicians to think differently and act differently and, and um, probably have a, a better tone of, uh, of discussion in our elections. Five of the last seven parliaments have yielded us minority parliaments. So, I mean, it's not proportionate, you know, relative to the percentage of vote, percentage of seats and all that. But it forces, you know, some collaboration. Obviously, the Liberals can't govern without Jagmeet Singh. Stephen Harper couldn't govern without the support from time to time of the Liberals or the Bloc or the NDP on different issues through our two minority parliaments. So it does force some cooperation. Um but but I think you know those who are holding out for electoral reform are are, are going to be holding out I think in, until they're covered in cobwebs. Look, I, I I 
I just think it's not going to happen. We've had multiple exercises in this country in British Columbia, my own province. Public is exhausted with it. We've we've tried this a number of times. And and I think look, the truth is, if we're if we're really blunt. Um, conservatives like first past the post because you can't win a majority without it. Liberals like preferential balloting because they're the second choice home of moderate Tories and moderate New Democrats. New Democrats like proportional representation because they can't win elections, but they sure like to have the balance of power. So no party will, will, will alter their stance because there, there's no consensus among enough parties in order to get a, a vote through parliament. And also the public is wary of politicians saying, trust me, whatever, we're going to change the system and it'll be good for you, not us. It'll be good for you. Most of the public just goes bullshit. So, you know, the, the, the public kind of understands that our system has existed for a long time. It's provided us relative stability. It's provided us accountability more than anything else because most provincial elections yield uh, majority parliaments. And so people can, you know, you elect a government, you have a government, they are in, in charge, they are responsible, and then I can hold them accountable on the back end. So uh, I think electoral reform is is, is not likely going to happen for a number of, of self-serving, self-interested, and, and I think rational reasons in the end. So how do we incentivize politicians to change their behavior? Well, I mean, what behavior exactly are you referring to? I mean, the, 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 white issue, the splitting of voters, the firing out of people okay Catherine, you go look i mean i think we need people who get into politics because they want to engage people and i don't mean to the across dispersions on my former colleagues i think a lot of people got in there for that but i think it really has to be like you want like you're getting to politics because you want something better and you're going to try to bring the biggest group um, when I started in politics, actually, my first incursion, it wasn't even, I didn't even go there, but I, I, I went to a young liberal event at U of T. I walked into the room and everyone was like hanging out with everyone they kind of looked at me like I was some alien. And it was like not very welcoming. And I'm sure this is probably like, I'm not saying this as liberals, it's probably every political party said, I was like, fuck that, I'm out. I'm going to actually go hang out with my swimming friends. So that's all I did. Um, and, and I think this is the problem, like politics becomes like an in club. Like it's kind of weird because a lot of people don't want to be part of that club. When I was trying to get people to sign up for my nomination, they're like, oh God, I have to join a party. Like they were like, that is not what I want to do. And it feels like, like a stamp for them. Yeah. Well, I was like, dudes, if I want to get elected that is actually like a precondition they're like and who signed up actually the best was my mom friends and i didn't even know their names i just knew their kids names they're like yeah if you want to go into politics you do it because you're a good mom you care about your kids you care about things and you're not a politician type now of course i'm a politician type because i was a politician and it's not a bad name to be a politician but heck, like we should all want to do better. If you go into politics, you shouldn't be saying like, I hope I can get the minimum, scrape away at the barrel, the minimum number of voters so that I can lead. Because first of all, it's pretty hard to actually get things done if you have the minimum number of voters. We see that, um, you know, in minority situations, like you should be saying, okay, this is my platform and it's pretty awesome. It's not 8,000 things. It's like, I only work in kind of three. So it's three things. It's like tackle climate change, grow the economy and create jobs and build inclusivity, inclusivity, but like, and actually motivate people. Now, how do you do that? I totally agree with James. Like I lived through the electoral reform thing. I did town halls. And one of the challenges that is that, you know, everyone kind of came with what they wanted. <laughs> and so in politics, every party, it is exactly as what James said. Everyone is very happy to do electoral reform or the status quo, depending on what benefits them. But that's once again, I want to go, that's like the minimum. The minimum is people vote. The maximum is people are motivated to do things. Like we got to do hard things. We got to tackle climate change. We got to bring a lot of people together. And, and to do that, you need to think about what do people care about? So why don't we just appeal to people? And I say that because sometimes even I have to catch myself on climate because people care about jobs, of course. And there are huge jobs in the clean economy, but we got to be focused on that. Um, it's not about passing legislation like to talk about a transition. It's actually investing in infrastructure and people to do that. And so I think there's an opportunity. But look, it's hard. Like, I didn't get out of politics, got chased out. I actually just wanted to talk about climate change globally. But I talked to lots of people, especially women, who were like, forget it. Why would I ever go into that? Go on and Twitter. I think, I think everyone sees it. We're reading I know, about and I think the we all need to take that on board. Women. Like, one, we have to go after social media companies. I'm done. Like, that's over. And when people say, like, oh, you block people or you only allow people to respond to who you follow, I was like, yeah, 
Yeah, I do that. Um, but for it's it's got to be a better space and that social media companies and the algorithms, that's over. We got to deal with that and just regulate. And Canadians, by the way, in citizens' assemblies have said they want that. So actually free advice to any politician. That's really popular. doesn't matter where you are in the political spectrum. But then we all have to hold ourselves accountable. Now, I'm no longer in politics, but it is not okay to James's point that people do videos that are flat out lies or personal attacks or whatever. Like you're turning everyone off and maybe that's your goal. Your goal is because you want everyone to be so disengaged. You just have to appeal to the very angry little base that every day supports whatever you do, no matter what. But I just want us to be more ambitious. Like I think we can actually do better and bring more people into politics and get better solutions and by the way, be more competitive and tackle climate change. But we're going to all have to dig a, a little deeper and we're going to have to tackle social media because I don't know, that is a huge problem. I'll, I'll jump off a few of those points because those, those are excellent. I think fundamentally we have to ensure we incent our, our decision makers um, to understand why it is not worthwhile to write off a significant portion of the population every freaking election. The fact that you can win with 33% in three major centers across the country, you know, and and, and we had a pre-conversation where James may have convinced me and changed my mind around, you know, my cer certain set of beliefs around whether we need electoral reform entirely. However, the, the problem does remain that politicians are incented to scrape by with the smallest uh, sort of group possible because they've been incented to write off the rest. And if you believe my thinking that the majority of us are strong opinions loosely held, that's not a negative thing. I think that's just who we are. We've got strong opinions. We present strongly because we have to. That's the world. But our opinions might be malleable. That's a good thing. We're open to changing our minds. We need to ensure our elected officials and those seeking office know that, that we are up for grabs, that there are more pathways than we currently have in, in, in our, at least that have been carved out by the strategists and the masterminds uh, in our electoral map and Canada. Two very tactical things. Number one, we need to fundamentally examine party nominations in this country. The, at the in-club status that Catherine was mentioning, that plays out at, in terms of who wins nominations across the country. Number two, that in-group status finds itself in an ever more dominant PMO and premier's offices across this country. We are seeing that cabinet has very little control. I mean, I'll look at Catherine and James to chime in on that if they agree, then it historically has, but strong prime minister's offices and premier's offices well, it might be good to creep the, the rudders on one's political agenda, I think is actually harming the, the latitude of voices that we allow, the broad perspective and texture we allow in some of our policymaking across the country. James, you want to go? I don't think James, James, were you muted? It would be actually interesting to know. <laughs> no, I'm not. I'm not muted. Uh, oh, no, no, I, I meant in politics when you were when you were a minister. Did you? Oh, I see. <laughs> uh, no, I don't think so. But I mean, you know, there the, the, the are two things that have to be balanced, right? Is that the, the public looks for peace, order, and good government, right? It's part of our ethos. We have deference in our political culture to authority. So the re responsibility for authority is to present back to the public a sense of stability and clarity and 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 strength. And so you see, you saw that yesterday, right? In the physical presentation of Prime Minister Trudeau standing in front of a camera with ministers flanking him of different portfolios relevant to the issue of democracy and transparency as a show of we are united, we're dealing with this, we're doing this. You saw it in British Columbia when John Horgan and, and Health Minister Adrian Dix would go out and they would give a briefing on COVID-19 and they would stand two steps back and one step to the right over the shoulder behind Dr. Bonnie Henry in a lab coat talking about the medical science of COVID as a deference to authority and leadership in dealing with a health global health crisis. So we have a system that sort of requires that behind the scenes, Bonnie Henry and Adrian Dix, I'm sure we're agreeing and disagreeing about the nomenclature and the approach and the politics and the policy and balancing things. And they're doing this in Saskatchewan and that. And Dr. Fauci just said this on the weekend. So we have to think about that. I'm sure that Justin Trudeau and Minister Freeland and Dominic LeBlanc had disagreements about the, the nature of the inquiry that's going to go on about interference in our elections and all that. But publicly, you have you have a, a show of strength. So people say, well, look, they're all just a bunch of bots. They're all a bunch of pawns. Who cares? No, our system is fierce debate and open speech and, and a robust search for the truth and the best public policy for the best broad public interest. And then you agree to it and then publicly you defend it. You measure twice, cut once. You, you do your analysis, you bring in the expert advice and thoughtful uh, uh, 
contributions, you make a decision and then you stick to it as a sign that the public can have confidence in you and therefore parliament should have confidence in you. So there, so, so it, it takes some explaining for the public to understand that, you know, people are just going at it like a crow and a badger in public and cabinet ministers disagreeing and shouting at each other and whatever. And, and that's not, that's more democratic if you want to sort of have, have the bleeding in the streets of politics like that. But it's not actually, I think, what the general public wants. They want those debates to happen, but they want a government to make a decision and to be, tell us why they did it, and then to be accountable in the back end if it works or doesn't. We oh, like oh, oh, it. wants that. Oh, darn. Can I nuance that? <laughs> you, you got 30 seconds. I mean, the nuance to that is, of course, you're a team in politics, but you have to have strong voices. And it is true that sometimes you know, you feel like you can actually speak up um, or, you know, you're going to be told like you have other folks, um, you know, sometimes staffers and you're like, I'm the elected person, <laughs> like, sorry, like I'm going to, you know, be have to say this. And um, I think that's really important. But one thing that would be interesting, I actually think that if you actually had someone right now that people that came out and said real things, the truth, and, you know, looked at how do we tackle big issues with real ideas and ambition, I think is a real opportunity for them. I don't think you need to change the electoral system. I think Canadians are really aching for it and are feeling a bit tired of, of all of it. And, you know, and that goes for all parties. Like, I'm not saying this as a liberal, I'm saying this is just a Canadian because I now I'm just someone looking in. And so I think there's an opportunity, but I think, look, it's on all of us. Um, you know, people are former politicians, people are part of the political system, people who care to actually expect better of politics and politicians and for politicians to actually say the truth and do hard things and, and to be honest when they can't or don't and to actually deliver. And that's the beauty of democracy is it is on all of us. So thank you all so much for this sparky conversation. There is so much more we could say, but it is time to wrap up the Q&A. Thanks again to Catherine McKenna, James Moore, Zane Velchi, and thank you to Bruce McClellan, and Genevieve Tomney and everyone at Proof Strategies for making this conversation possible. As our panelists turn off their cameras, I'm just gonna let our audience know about what we have coming up. And I also have some thank yous. Thank you to our annual sponsors, Air Canada, Inspire and Shaw. Uh, thank you to everyone for joining us. On March 28th, we're gonna be in Ottawa, IRL in real life. We'll also be live streaming for the Walrus Talks Economic Reconciliation. And then on April 4th, join us online for the Walrus Talks at Home Indigenous Health. Check in with us at thewalrus.ca slash events. That's where you're going to find our schedule. You can sign up for these events. We also post videos from all our events, including, including this one in the Walrus Talks video room. Keep an eye on your inbox. We're going to send you an email as a follow-up. The best way to stay in touch with us is to opt into our newsletter. Uh, we have some exciting announcements coming up about stories and in-person events in our 20th year, so you don't want to miss out on that. We always say the walrus is a unique beast in the media landscape because we're a registered, registered charity. We produce award-winning journalism, events, and podcasts, and we do this with our community of support. So if you enjoyed this free event, consider making a donation. You can do so at thewalrus.ca. Just click on donate. Thanks again for being a part of this event and for trusting us here at the walrus. Have a great day ahead. <laughs>